Good evening. In this discussion on George Marston's The Outrageous Idea of Christian Scholarship, I'd like to return to last week's lecture on interpretative trends in history given by Dr. Roger Schultz and Dr. Samuel Smith. In it, Dr. Smith broaches an interesting dilemma. If the trajectory of academia is to do away with the absolutes, to remove Christianity or render it meaningless, does, quote, having a place at the table require a compromise on our Christian integrity, or does it dilute our commitment to a Christian worldview? I turned to the outrageous idea of Christian scholarship to seek what Dr. Smith calls Morriston's remedy for the very unacademic and very unhistorical nature of the division of Christianity and the academic realm, or what Morriston refers to as a step towards clarifying what the ancient enterprise of relating faith and learning might mean to the academy today. To shed some light on the subject, Reverend Robert McElroy's review of the outrageous idea of Christian scholarship does a superb job of detailing Marston's three major arguments. First, contemporary university life stigmatizes faith-informed scholarship on grounds which the university never applies to other pre-theoretical influences which shape scholarly inquiry. Second, that faith-informed scholarship has a legitimate role in the university if it follows rules appropriate to the field of study in question. And finally, expelling religious belief from scholarly enterprise demands that the believing scholar divide his or her very self in a way which is demeaning to integrity and is ultimately impossible. Dr. Smith questioned whether Christian scholars would have to compromise to achieve Marston's goals of reciprocity, legitimacy, and probity in academia. For a possible answer, I'd like to delve into Mark Knowles how an evangelical won the Bancroft Prize in American Evangelicalism, George Marston, and the State of American Religious History to see just how far Christian historical scholarship has come nearly 20 years after the outrageous idea of Christian scholarship. Mark Knoll says that the current situation for evangelical historians is relatively good. The relatively good must be stressed in order to avoid deceptive triumphalism. Knoll notes areas where Christian historians can improve. We do not set the general agenda for professional scholarship, have not made serious contributions to first level theoretical discussions about the nature of historical knowledge, and have not made inroads in communicating their work within evangelical churches themselves. That said, there has been marked improvement for Christian historians. Knowles states that as, of, as a whole, Christian historians are regularly admitted to the nation's best PhD programs in history, win distinction in their field, our seminars and conferences draw all academic circles, and well-respected Christian historians are well-placed in research universities and appear in scholarly publications and organizations. And so, the crux of these arguments made by Marston relies on the reciprocity of respect, integrity, and a holistic approach to what makes a good scholar. A place at the table requires equal access without losing our voice or our cause. A belief system integrated in class, gender, race, politics, or religion should not mark, disarm, or disqualify a scholar as each of these aspects informs their nature, their bias, and their perspective. While this assertion does not mean that scholars must compromise their belief system, it does mean that reciprocity requires empathy, perspective taking, and civility. The conflict that Dr. Smith points to, that divisive nature that these aspects can sometimes inscribe in people, can just as easily be part of that consensus that allows commonality to overcome our differences. Thank you.